AUK, those of you who are visiting. Uh, it's also good to see some of our public policy and international relations students here. It's a real pleasure for me to introduce the speaker today who has been a great friend of Kosovo for a long time. And Kosovo is fortunate to have friends who are in positions of influence in an important country like the United Kingdom. And Kosovo is particularly fortunate, I believe, to have somebody who has taken a sufficiently deep interest in Kosovo and in the region to have written a book which is now being published in the UK, soon to be published, I believe, in Albanian translation here. I believe. Uh, I can't, I, I, I've heard rumors of that effect, but uh, for now, um, a book with the title, Why Kosovo Still Matters. Um, I've read a little of this because I was given an advanced copy, and I think this is an important book, and I hope that it will do what the author intends, which is to keep the eyes of some key people in the world focused on Kosovo. Dennis McShane is uh, unusually, perhaps, for a British member of parliament, uh, and somebody who has served as a minister in Britain under Tony Blair, uh, somebody who knows Europe well. And by Europe, I mean not just countries like France or Switzerland, where he has lived and speaks the language, but also Eastern Europe. Uh, Dennis's father is from Poland, and who particularly knows Southeast Europe well. Uh, he is somebody who truly understands, I believe, a vision of Europe as all-encompassing and which has Kosovo as an integral part. So without further ado, I, it's my honor to introduce my fellow Oxford University alumni, <laughs> Dennis McShane. Thank you, Chris. I just learned you're at the same college as David Cameron. I'm not sure if that's a, uh, <laughs> if that was a state secret that uh, not even WikiLeaks managed to uh, uh, reveal. But there we are. It's to your honour. David's a very, very nice man. And also, together with the British Foreign Secretary, Europe, William Hague, and Europe Minister David Livington, I think he's a good friend uh, of. His chief advisor actually is a lovely lady uh, uh, from Bosnia, Bosniak, and I once said to Boris Tadic, do you know who writes William Hague's speeches on the Balkans? And Boris said, yes, a Bosniak. <laughs> so that was enough. Actually, I, I'm, not really, I'm a friend of Kosovo, yes, I'm a friend of Serbia, but I'm actually more interested in the future of Europe because when I was the age of certainly the younger people in this uh, audience, um, uh, the Europe I knew was just so profoundly different. Half of it living under a communist dictatorship, Spain, Portugal, Greece living under authoritarian fascist dictatorships, uh, the country of my mother's side, uh, Ireland so poor that the holiday town we went to would have cattle driven through its streets in the late 1950s, early 1960s. And I look at the Europe today, the vital all at university, nearly all at university, bar the boy who's got to work hard to get into Oxford or Edinburgh, Chris. Uh, the Europe that they could go to is just so incredibly different. Open, <coughs> 900,000 British citizens living in Spain, and at the last count, uh, Ten of them spoke Spanish. Um, you have uh, 400,000 French people living in uh, London and all speaking much better English than the local London people do. Uh, you have people coming and going, uh, half a million Polish citizens going backwards and forwards. Uh, you've got people studying. And yes, with all the difficulties, and Kosovans have lived through great difficulties in the last 30 years still a much better Europe than for all of the 20th century. And so what we have to do is to construct a Europe that survives the 21st century 
open, tolerant, full of young entrepreneurs, full of people with confidence uh, in their own country, uh, ultimately, I think, able to live fully in their country. My ambition for Kosovo is to see uh, the youngest country in Europe, literally in terms of when it declared its independence, the youngest country in Europe in terms of its population, finding and defining a new future uh, so that uh, Kosovo becomes a byword in a very short time for energy, for entrepreneurship, for excitement, uh, for cultural generation, and transforms the, frankly, historic vision of the Balkans, which sadly, too sadly, remains uh, too uh, negative. Bismarck famously said that the Balkans were not worth the bones of a Pomeranian grenadier, uh, and uh, that attitude still pervades. Look at the great crisis country for the, Euro the Eurozone now, Greece. It's profoundly uh, an aspect of that Balkan crisis. But I'm very optimistic, because each time I come back to Kosovo, and I've been visiting regularly, uh, now for more than a decade. I see more energy, I see nicer streets, new shops, this great university, uh, and more English and other languages being spoken, uh, and people not having to go abroad to get a very good university degree, as some of my friends here have. My great friend, Edgar Hodgson, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, his assistant, Petri Salimi, who between them have energized Kosovan foreign policy uh, and have built new networks of influence on behalf of the people and government of Kosovo uh, in a very remarkable time. And frankly, they're not quite sure if it's Batman and Robin, but they're the most dynamic <laughs> duo uh, in, in any foreign ministry that I know in, in Europe at the uh, moment. And what the purpose of this book is, why Kosovo still matters, and really I think for many people here, there won't perhaps be that much that's new, in it, but there are too many academic monographs on Kosovo, long 500 page books of immensely erudite history. And there is the most marvelous history to be written about uh, Kosovo. But who would ever dare to think that Leon Trotsky, uh, as a correspondent for a Ukrainian newspaper, was writing about the Serb policy of exterminating Kosovo, not in 1995, but in 1905 or 1910. Uh, and you get into the highways and byways of Kosovo history. It is absolutely fascinating. But my job isn't to do that. It really is to try and change the image of Kosovo as a problem into the image of Kosovo as a story, what the French call an histoire. Uh, the same word for story and history in, in, in French. And to present to the people of the rest of Europe, my own country, in the United States and Canada, that Kosovo does have a story, a genuine story, an authentic story, a story of a land, a people, at the crossroads of history between uh, North and South Europe, between the Moors and the Christians, between the Serbs and the Ottomans, uh, between uh, the Albanians and, and, and the Serbs, but always preserving an element of an identity uh, that sadly was just so badly crushed uh, in the Milosevic years. Uh, and I do think, I mean, I talk about Spain, I talk about Greece, none of them, Franco was no Milosevic, he did terribly cruel things, but there was no Srebrenica, there was no uh, the kind of mass killings that took place here, uh, the terrible wars of 1998 and 1999, uh, and I, I do think uh, that uh, the Serb people in Europe hasn't come to terms with the fact that both nationalism and populism in Serbia gave rise to Milosevic, and then we in Europe did not understand the necessity and the need to stop it because the Balkans were an unknown region, we didn't understand it, we didn't know where Kosovo was, uh, uh, but in fact, Kosovo came into every one of our own homes in that, in my constituency, where I am the Member of Parliament, it's next door to Sheffield, it's a classical steel and coal mining constituency, and there we had our share of Kosovo, Kosovo asylum seekers, a very popular, nice boys, who married the local girls, we got Kosovo boys alike, um, and um, uh, 
they, they were made welcome, but nonetheless they were a problem. They were seen as you know, arriving and having to find housing and social benefits and the rest of it. And I mean, I argue that the need to take the problem seriously isn't just to do good or play fair, but actually in terms of our own national coherence and solidarity in Britain and all the other countries. I mean, Albania now is the fourth language of Switzerland. So many Kosovans had to leave uh, Kosovo uh, during the terrible conflicts of the, from 1987 onwards, and they went into Switzerland. And I do think you know, Kosovo owes a debt to uh, Switzerland, and I'm very pleased that Michelin Calme Ray has just stopped being the foreign minister of Switzerland. He's been a great champion of Kosovo uh, in uh, her work as a foreign minister from a small, very rich, and highly respected country in <coughs> recent years. And so we do have, though, uh, this failure to find a final settlement in Kosovo, which I describe and discuss in my uh, book. Uh, the problem is that the world moves on. And the Kosovans actually have behaved very, very well. They don't do violence like in Albania. They don't kill a prime minister like in Jinjic. And like Jinjic was assassinated in Belgrade. Uh, they don't hide their war criminals in the way the Serbs hid Mladic. And I could have taken you to the block of flats where Mladic was living all those years or introduced you to his wife who was getting his pension. Uh, contrast that with Mr. Haradinaj Ranush going up voluntarily to uh, the, the Hague. Uh, and this, frankly, uh, at times, it's, it's good behaviour, it makes sense, we don't want violence, we want cooperation with international organisations, but the price for that good behaviour is uh, that the world tends then to uh, for, for, to forget you. And Kosovo is also a victim of giant international power politics. It's not just Serbia, it's the fact that uh, for Russia, it is very, very easy at the United Nations simply to refuse recognition to Kosovo, not to rewrite 12, UN Resolution 1244. And I must say, if any of you want to do a small thesis uh, on international diplomacy, examine the text of Resolution 1244. It is one of the worst written texts uh, ever in the history of the UN. And I would like, you know, I used to be a minister, I used to write this stuff, I would love to find out in a few days the passions exploded over the intervention of uh, NATO led by Tony Blair and Bill Clinton with the backing of Schroeder and Jospin and Massimo Delena. I would love to know who actually wrote that text because it contained poison pills in it that continue, uh, frankly, to poison uh, Kosovo's uh, correct uh, desire to be received as a young country, a nation state in its own right at the UN. But for Russia, it's very, very cynical. It doesn't really care about Kosovo. Uh, I spoke to many Russian politicians and foreign policy experts at conferences and seminars all over Europe and in Russia. And they say, well, I'm not really interested, Dennis. Uh, you give us Abkhazia, we'll give you Kosovo. <laughs> and and you know, for the Russians, it's a completely cynical power play uh, in which they just irritate and make a nuisance of themselves and stop the big Western democracies of Europe, Atlantic democracies, from moving uh, forward. Now, I think there's a big sea change, of course, because the Serbs decided to take the question of uh, Kosovo's status to the International Criminal Court. And that ruling was absolutely unambiguous. It said two important things. Firstly, Resolution 1244 does not prevent Kosovo becoming or declaring itself an independent state. And that's an extremely important international law ruling. And secondly, it says there's setting no precedent for North Cyprus, for Moldova, for Transnistria, and for all the other parts of Europe and the world where uh, there are tensions between an existing state structure and the desires for separatism uh, elsewhere. I mean, we have to live with this now in Scotland, where the uh, Scottish Nationalist Party is the dominant party in government in Scotland. It's, it's very uh, influential uh, and is looking for uh, independence, possibly from 
uh, the United uh, Kingdom. But you know, it would be quite wrong, in my view, to say, oh, because we're frightened of Scotland becoming independent, therefore uh, we should not recognise uh, Kosovo. And we need to get this message out that international law is quite clearly on uh, Kosovo's side. Also get the message out that Serbia is not respecting Resolution 1244 either. As Chancellor Angela Merkel made very clear to President Tadic, the Serbs are maintaining illegal parallel structures in the north of Kosovo, over which they have absolutely no right to do. The European Union gives about 200 million euros a year in, in, in money ahead of any accession talks to uh, Serbia. That 200 million dollars, uh, sorry, euros, is being used to help maintain the parallel structures in the north. And I'm going to make very clear say to the European Union, to our MEP friends, that that money should be cut off. Because if you go to Belgrade, I don't know if people are aware of it, you can see a clock up there that says how much Serb taxpayers' money is going every minute into uh, maintaining the fiction that northern Kosovo is part of Serbia. It's a huge drain on the Serb economy. That's why Serbia is running a huge public deficit. And Serbia is, if it was in the Eurozone, it would be Greece. Whereas Kosovo uh, has a very healthy public finances, believe it or not, maybe that's because they don't spend enough money, but uh, um, that's not necessarily the worst thing in the present world uh, conjuncture. So I think there are big, big possibilities uh, as well for uh, Kosovo uh, to move forward economically. And my appeal to the younger generation would be, uh, uh, to paraphrase Kennedy, Wait not upon what Europe can do for you, but rather show Europe what Kosovo can do for itself. And for that, you have to create, for example, the, why not create the first Wi-Fi nation? Uh, it shouldn't be possible. It would be nice if you got Blackberry down here as well, but that's another story. Uh, but you know, we've moved past Wi-Fi. Uh, uh, we've moved past Blackberries now. I might stop working. Uh, three weeks ago for three days and I was completely cut off and all my children said why have you got this out of date bit of rubbish get an iPhone for like everybody else <laughs> um, so uh, I have my iPad and perhaps I'm going to get my iPhone and come to Kosovo and you're perfectly in touch with the rest of uh, the, the world there's so many young, clever, able parallel, horizontal vertical, sideways 360 points and the compass thinkers and uh, people in, in Kosovo. That means that, that you should be looking, you know, to, uh, now that Mr. Johnson's died and now that Mr. Gates just does charity work, where is the next Apple or the next European Microsoft going to come from? Why not uh, here? Uh, and we have to encourage tourism because it's a wonderful country to, to visit. Uh, the skiing resorts, obviously a bit of investment in the infrastructure, I think can be the best in the uh, Balkans. Uh, now clearly there has to be legal structures to allow that to happen. We have to ensure that planning permission and development permission is given openly and transparently to investors and isn't left in the hands just of political uh, favouritisms and, and uh, appointees. Uh, you've got huge potential, I think, with the billions of euros or dollars of uh, important metals and some rare earths uh, in Kosovo that can be exploited because even if Europe has got a lot of difficulties, China, India, Turkey, other Asian countries are rising, rising, rising. Every one of your mobile phones, your, 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 your new you know, things that we use uh, to communicate with, uh, have, to have to have these very rare elements in them. So Kosovo should be working hard to uh, achieve that. And, uh, I do regret the fact that there are five countries that don't recognise uh, the European Union. Uh, and I've written about this in El Pais and spoken about it directly to people like George Papandreou and Prime Minister Zapatero in Spain. Uh, each country has a different difficulty, to be honest, in terms of its non-recognition of uh, Kosovo. In the case of Spain, the recognition happened right in the middle of a very tense uh, closely fought election in February, March 2008 uh, and a 
a time when the ruling Socialist Party was still locked into quite a clear anti-American philosophical perspective, and where they were accused by the Conservative Party that if they made any concessions to Kosovo, that would be like saying the Basque country or Catalonia could separate themselves from uh, Spain. So we have to make clear, citing the International Court of Justice ruling, that Kosovo sets absolutely no precedent at all. And uh, people who uh, have any influence in Spain and speak Spanish, who you know Spanish political classes, Spanish write in Spanish newspapers and say, look, Spain can recognize Kosovo and it means nothing in terms of either the Basque country or Catalonia or has any impact at all on the internal uh, relationship between Spain and its different um, national peripheral um, component uh, regions. Uh, Similarly, um, in Slovakia, it's to do much more with the fact that Budapest issued passports to the new government, issued passports to uh, every Hungarian living or uh, Hungarian origin person living in Slovakia, uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the Slovakian majority parties uh, resent the Hungarian parties uh, and don't feel they should do anything that supports any idea of separate. Again, you have to talk quietly and in a friendly way to uh, Bratislava and explain uh, that their problem between Slovakian majority and Hungarian minority has got nothing at all to do uh, with uh, Kosovo. It's a different story again uh, in, um, in Romania, uh, where the Romanians have a proverb that says, the only friends we've ever had in our lives have been the Black Sea and the Serbs. Because Romania has never been invaded from the Black Sea or never been invaded by Serbia. Everybody else in Europe has invaded Romania at some stage, tried to conquer it, tried to cut it up. And the Romanians see themselves historically in an axis with Serbia against the Ottoman Empire, against the wars, and, and, and so on. Yeah, we can all live in that kind of history. I remember when England ruled half of France, but it's quite difficult to get it back now. Um, and you have again to be gentle and explain uh, to the Romanians uh, that uh, Serbia itself is doing a huge disservice by its policy of non-recognition of Kosovo. Kosovo is never going to return to rule by Belgrade. And when I talk to Serb politicians, they all accept it. I said, why don't you draw the logical conclusion and come to an arrangement with Mr. Tachi or the Kosovo government for adequate protection, which is on offer under the Atasari plan, it doesn't go beyond that, on offer from Mr. Tachi, on, on offer from all the Kosovan politicians for uh, proper protection for Serb culture, Serb religion, Serb language uh, in the north of the country. I myself would like to see, because I lived in Switzerland for many years, as was mentioned, uh, and there if you buy a, a carton of milk or a bottle of beer or sausage in the, in the supermarket, everything is printed in th three languages, German, French and Italian. So why not have a policy in Kosovo that everything is printed in Albanian, Serb and English uh, to show that Kosovo is going to become a trilingual nation. Um, and just doing little symbolic gestures like that could help perhaps to put Kosovo and Pristina in the driving seat as defining this problem uh, rather than not, I think, under the present um, leadership and the present uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs being reactive uh, to what happens from uh, uh, Serbia. So that's what we have to say is that Serbia is also the big loser in terms of how it deals with the Kosovo problem. Here we are 12 years after the end of the conflict and there isn't a final settlement. It's like going into Germany in 1957 and still there was uh, tensions and conflicts arising from uh, World War II. It does Serbia no good at all. Belgrade is a great city, it's a great multicultural city. I, I, mean, I know you can't visit it or don't visit it, but you should. Uh, the Serb people also are full of energy and innovation uh, and should be partners of Kosovo in showing how uh, this part of the Balkans can actually be uh, 
uh, more European than other European states itself, certainly more European probably than England at the moment. Um, now, that requires, I think, some rewriting, some perceptions. Uh, I don't speak Albanian, but I try with some help to look at some of the Albanian papers, just as I don't speak Serbo Croat, so I'm Serbian now, not Serbo Croat, but I, I get reports of coverage in the Serb papers and Tirana papers, and frankly, we do need a rather more moderate, a rather more balanced uh, press reporting in the entire uh, region. We need more New York Times, Le Monde, Republica, and a bit less Bildzeitung or Sun uh, or, or New York Post, you know, the tabloid, uh, exciting, hysterical um, headlines uh, where everything is presented uh, in black and White. When I look at Greek newspapers printing Mrs. Merkel in a Nazi uniform with a uh, swastika, well, frankly, it's, it's just horrible. Uh, and Greece and Greek media do themselves huge disservice by that kind of um, uh, language. But I, I could give you stories of the British tabloid papers that are just as excessive and extravagant. But I do think there's a very big responsibility uh, to develop a, a honest um, and post-nationalistic journalism in both Serbia and uh, in uh, Kosovo. So I hope that there will be serious studies uh, of uh, Kosovo as a nation and as a people in the historical context. I would like to see more people in England learning Albania. It's, all very, it's very, very unfair, of course, because so many of Kosovan friends speak such good English. Uh, but you don't really understand the country simply through uh, translation and contacts with uh, uh, good friends. Uh, my task simply is to keep telling the story, the histoire, both the narrative and the history of Kosovo in the hope that um, not my own co colleagues uh, in, in the British Parliament or indeed the Conservative administration where I think there's strong supporters of Kosovo or friends of the United States where I think again on both the Republican and the Democratic side Kosovo has lots and lots of friends but there are simply some blockages and I say again and again to Spanish and Greek friends, Slovaks and Cypriots and Romanian friends you damage Europe because when Europe does not speak as one on any foreign policy issue, it is much weaker. There are some foreign policy issues, like, for example, the conflict in Iraq, where the passions were so strong, it was impossible for Europe to speak as one. We just have to accept that. Some issues like Libya, where Europe wasn't able to speak as one. And we'll see in a year or two years' time uh, whether the Libyan intervention it was very good to chase uh, Mr. Colonel Gaddafi out the way he was butchered uh, and publicly uh, his body put on public display, I think shamed everybody. Uh, we'll see whether the Libyan intervention was a huge success or not in a year or two. But it is frankly preposterous and wrong, and very, it weakens Europe considerably, that the uh, countries that don't recognize Kosovo still maintain that uh, position uh, because the Russians, the Chinese, the Brazilians, the Turks, they say, Europe, you can't even agree on something actually quite peripheral uh, and, and not very world historically significant, and that is the recognition of Kosovo, and you want us to listen to you? It plays right into the Russian hands, because Russia's policy, is, foreign policy, is incredibly simple. It's Russia up, America down and Europe out. Um, and again, the failure of uh, our friends in Spain, Slovakia and Greece and, and Cyprus and Slovakia uh, to recognize Kosovo, uh, I'm afraid, allows, Ru allows Russia uh, the luxury of not taking the European Union as seriously as it should. Changing states, getting states to take different positions is very, very hard. Now, older members of this audience will recall that the United States pretended for nearly 25 years that communist China didn't exist. It maintained a fiction that Taiwan, which is a very, very nice island country, was the only legitimate government for the whole of the billion strong Chinese population. And then President Nixon and Henry Kissinger came along and said, the emperor has no clothes. 
This is silly. They went to China. They acknowledged it was a communist country. It had killed lots of Americans, imprisoned some, disappeared some in the Korean War, confiscated without compensation uh, millions of dollars of American property. When the 